Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, new topic on disorders of development of teeth. So the learning outcomes for this topic are identify and describe disturbances in number, size, form and structure of teeth. Describe in detail hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. And number three, describe in detail clinical pathological aspects of amelogenesis imperfecta, dentinogenesis imperfecta and dentin dysplasia. Outline of this lecture basically would include uh, disturbances in number of teeth, disturbances in size, uh, in form and structure and lastly I will touch upon uh, a few craniofacial anomalies. So starting with disturbances in number of teeth, number one we have uh, hypodontia. Hypo uh, means less, dontia means teeth. So congenital absence of one or several teeth is described as hypodontia. Now anodontia on the other hand actually means uh, complete absence of one or both dentition. So this is common in the permanent dentition. It's very unusual for the deciduous teeth uh, to be absent and if, if you do see it it's, it's something it's a very big cause of concern. Uh, it affects 2 to 10 percent of the population. Um, it's common in females and the most common teeth that are absent uh, in cases with anodontia, third molars, maxillary lateral incisors and mandibular second premolars. Right? Now when we talk of disturbance of the number of teeth, we, we have to talk about not just less number of teeth but also something called as more number of teeth which is supernumerary teeth. Now continuing with first hypodontia, I would like to introduce These you photographs of, of cases where there are single teeth that are missing and here where there are multiple teeth missing and when there are multiple teeth that are missing okay uh, with, with specific morphology of the teeth that are present then we need to think about certain conditions which are common in hypodontia one of them uh, is called ectodermal dysplasia it's also called hereditary ectodermal dysplasia or ectodermal dysplasia syndrome uh, this is the common syndromes that are associated are hypohydrotic or just hydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. The etiology for this uh, condition is a chromosomal defect leading to the aberrant development in ectodermal structures. Right. So all ectodermal structures that that uh, arise basically are affected here. So it is an X-linked. Uh, it, it affects the X-linked hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia gene or the ED1 gene, right? The specific gene is GJB6 gene, which is uh, present on chromosome 13. Q stands for long arm, right? As I've discussed in my previous lecture. So this is the nomenclature of, of, the, um, of the gene. And this is responsible for the hypohydrotic type. So the clinical features, most commonly it's seen in the people from the uh, white, white population uh, since it affects all the ectodermal structures right there's a defect in ectodermal structures you will see there's a defect in the teeth hair nails okay which is uh, evident since infancy and childhood so these patients have sparse scalp hair okay which is usually short fine and uh, their sweat glands are absent or sparse mucus glands are absent um, in salivary glands like terminal duct and upper respiratory tract okay uh, which gives rise to cerastomia as well all right uh, teeth show abnormal morphology or absence nails are brittle thin or deformed and other uh, features that are noted in some cases are uh, CLCP which stands for cleft lip and cleft palate deficient hearing vision missing fingers or toes lack of breast development now this is a clinical photograph of, of a patient here uh, who is having uh, ectodermal dysplasia. So the most common feature that you're able to identify here is number one, the sparse hair, all right? And the fact uh, that the patient has, has uh, uh, specific features, facial features. Right? So oral manifestations of ectodermal dysplasia include hypodontia or complete anodontia. I've already explained what those terms mean. Uh, the teeth that are usually present are either truncated or cone shaped. Uh, there is decreased vertical dimension because of missing teeth. What happens is the vertical dimension of the jaw 
produces, thus giving rise to an older appearance person, right? Uh, with decreased vertical dimensions, the, lead, the lips appear protuberant. Uh, the patients have high arched palate, uh, sometimes deaf palate, and there is xerostomia. So xerostomia is because it affects the salivary glands, right? There are defective salivary glands because salivary glands are also developed from the from ectoderm, from the ectoderm. Okay, moving on. The next is supernumerary teeth. So the term supernumerary means more teeth or hyperdontia. So here in this picture, as you see, there is an extra tooth here present between the central incisors. And uh, this is one of the most common uh, supernumerary tooth that is, that is seen. It's common in the maxillary anterior and the molar region followed by the mandibular premolars. Again, it's common in females. One to three percent of the population is affected. Supernumerary teeth is very unusual in deciduous teeth or deciduous dentition and is usually associated with cleft palate, pseudocranial dysplasia or Gardner syndrome. Okay, I would like you to look up what, what these um, conditions actually are. So here you see a patient here with, uh, with two supernumerary teeth present on the palatal aspect right uh, behind the, and, uh, the maxillary central incisors okay now this is a radiograph of, of a case okay again a free source radiograph from google images where you can see multiple supernumerary teeth right so every uh, tooth that is in a number that is written as sn is a supernumerary teeth so actually if you look at this the one two three four five six seven eight 9, 10, 11, 12 supernumerary teeth. Okay, quite an unusual case, but again, uh, it's possible. So, okay, so moving on to disturbances in size of teeth. Okay, so if we, we've looked at the number of teeth, now let's look at the size. Okay, if uh, the size is small, then we call it microdontia. If the size of the tooth is more than the usual size, then it's called Macrodontia. This is a case of uh, of a lateral incisor, okay, um, actually a lateral incisor which is much smaller and appears peg shaped, okay. So this is single tooth microdontia, also described as peg shaped lateral incisor. Okay, so now moving on to disturbances in the form of teeth, okay. So under that we have gemination, fusion, concrescence, dilaceration. Talon's cups, cusp, dense indente, dense evaginatus, and torodontism. So I'm going to go through each one of them and uh, explain uh, each of these lesions one by one. So let's start with gem. So here is a case of, uh, of a gentleman who turned up for to a dental clinic for routine dental checkup, and on examination it was found that the the teeth in the mandibular arch actually have uh, an extra tooth. Okay. So, and on closer examination, the mandibular incisors, the central incisors, uh, appear to be macrodon, appear to show macrodontia. But when we, they took a radiograph, they actually noticed that there is partial development of two teeth from a single tooth jump. Okay, so there's basically incomplete divin, division. So this is an example of a case of gemination. All right. So this is where uh, the, the clinically there appears to be a macrodontia. And the cause of macrodontia over here is basically gemination, right? Which is partial development of two teeth from a single tooth, but following. Now, the next is fusion, okay? Fusion is the union between the dentine and oblique or the enamel of two or more separate developing teeth, okay? Now, this uh, here is a picture of of a child with uh, uh, fusion between his uh, central maxillary central and uh, lateral incisors okay as you are able to notice here so again clinically this presence as a macrodontia okay and uh, on closer examination on you notice that basically there are two separate teeth that are actually fusing together uh, at the enamel or dentine at the enamel or dentine now um, the degree of union is variable and may involve the crown, the root or both. Okay, 
is very unusual for teeth to be united only by the enamel and joining of uh, the dentine and pulp chamber uh, is rather more frequent okay so this is fusion so basically in a case of fusion how do we differentiate between a case of fusion and germination uh, in a case of germination there will be an ex there will be extra teeth in the mandibular uh, in, in the in the in the oral cavity where uh, when you count the number of teeth but when you when it's a case of fusion because there are two teeth that are fusing together there will be a so less is how there will be less number of teeth probably be able to differentiate all right so this is fusion right all through uh, the the dentine pulp and partly the the enamel whereas here there is a fusion of the crown okay with separate uh, then uh, with the separate pulp chambers the next is concretion so let's look at what is concretion concretion is an acquired disorder in which the roots of uh, one or more teeth are united by the cementum after formation of the crown okay after formation of the crown so this is this is how it looks so the basically fusion of teeth at the cementum is basically called um, concretions okay so this is again uh, another picture of a tooth with concretions and this is a crown section of of the tooth and wherein you can clearly see that the crown structures are are separate but the cementum is where the fusion takes place the next is dilaceration Dilaceration. Uh, this is this is a picture of a tooth, uh, dilacerated tooth that's been extracted. All right. Uh, so dilaceration is when crown of a tooth is displaced from its normal alignment with the root. Okay. So usually the crown and the, the root are uh, are in line with each other. If there is an angulation that that sets in, then that is what is called dilaceration. The most common teeth that are dilacerated are mandibular third molars, where you see the the root beer dilacerations this is the histological appearance all right the ground section of this uh, of another tooth here and you can clearly appreciate the the angulation between the crown and the root the next disturbance in the form of teeth is uh, talons so talons cusp uh, is commonly seen in maxillary mandibular anterior teeth okay and it's an extra cusp of hard tissue that protrudes from this singulum area okay from the singulum area so here if you look at it there is an extra cusp over here and uh, this space typical appearance of this projection is conical and actually resembles an eagle's talon right an eagle's claw and that's the reason why it's a, it's actually called a talon's cusp the next disturbance in the form of teeth is dents in dente or as the term suggests tooth within a so dense in dente okay is a rare developmental tooth anomaly that is characterized by invagination invagination of uh, the enamel organ into the dental papilla that begins at the crown and often extends to the root even before calcification of the dental tissues okay so what basically happens is there is an appearance of a tooth within a tooth because of the invagination of the enamel organ so in fact the other name for dense in dente is dense invaginatus okay. we call it dense invaginatus is because this is how a tooth actually appears okay so there is an appearance of a tooth structure within another tooth structure okay with very large uh, pulp chambers okay and uh, this uh, anomaly actually makes the tooth uh, very prone to caries and peripical pathologies. The other lesion is dense evaginatus. So, as the word says, evaginatus, so there is a protuberance. So, this is a case of uh, dense evaginatus. So, as I mentioned, there is an extra protuberance or an extra cusp on, on the teeth. So dense evaginatus is a rare developmental anomaly where the outer surface appears to have an extra cusp. Uh, usually affects the premolars, mandibular premolars, and it can occur either unilaterally or bilaterally. Now the danger with these teeth is that there is usually an additional pulp horn over here, and uh, if these teeth do need to undergo root canal treatment, uh, the dental surgeon needs to 
Um, the last uh, disturbance in the form of teeth is torodontism. Okay. So torodontism, toro means bull and dontism means teeth. So this is basically uh, a condition, developmental disturbance where in the teeth appear like bull teeth. Okay. So torodontism is a developmental disturbance of teeth in which the tooth body is the tooth body is enlarged at the expense of the roots. So you have short roots, but you have uh, large uh, crowns okay an enlarged pulp chamber is seen a pical displacement of the pulp chamber as you notice here and a lack of constriction at the cemento enamel junction right so there's a lack of cemento enamel junction uh, constriction at the cemento enamel junction which is characteristic now most most commonly torodontisms are are isolated torodontisms if multiple teeth are affected then they are associated with certain syndromes for example glen feltius syndrome okay Moving on, let's look at uh, enamel hypoplasia. So I think uh, you're very familiar. Enamel uh, hypoplasia means where there is uh, uh, abnormal formation of enamel. Now there could be two types, either a hereditary type or, or an environmental type. Now under the hereditary type, you have amelogenesis imperfecta, which I'm going to explain to you in the slides further. And under the environmental type, basically there are many different causes for which uh, there can be hyperplastic enamel. Okay. Amelogenesis imperfecta is a genetically inherited disorder. Okay. Uh, now this gene uh, is uh, autosomally dominant. Okay. And uh, predominantly autosomally dominant and is less linked to the X link, uh, X gene. Okay. Uh, it shows a complex inheritance. Okay. Enamel proteins are affected, such as uh, amelogenin. Uh, tuftalin um, and uh, so on and so forth uh, and uh, the, the defect in the gene leads to these abnormal protein formation uh, which leads to the uh, fault in the, the maturation as well as calcification uh, of the enamel. Now this prevalence is the prevalence of this condition is variable and it affects both the dentition. So these are very very important um, general uh, information about amelogenesis imperfecta. Now, amelogenin, the protein uh, gene, are found both on the X and Y chromosomes, but that on the X accounts for about 90% of the uh, RNA transcription that takes place. Okay. Now, the enamel proteins, as I just mentioned, uh, is composed of amyloblastin, enamelin, and tuftalin. Okay. So these are three important proteins that are required. To be uh, to be well well uh, secreted uh, for enamel to be produced normally, and in amelogenesis imperfecta, there is a problem with amelogenesis, and thus there is a, a defective enamel. Now, under the types, there are two types: you have hypomaturation and you have hypoplastic type. Okay, so let's first look at the hypomaturation type. Now, in the hypomaturation type, okay, basically there's a defect in the maturation of the enamel, right? So there's a defect in the maturation process of the enamel or the mineralization process, okay? So newly erupted teeth, they appear normal in size and shape and have enamel of normal thickness. However, the enamel is soft and chalky in consistency, okay? Now the color is variable, white to brownish yellow, as you can see in the picture over here. Uh, and the enamel has the same density as dentine and thus is rapidly lost by adhesion or abrasion. Okay. Now hypomineralization type is the most common form of, uh, of uh, amelogenesis imperfect. Second type is the hypoplastic type, okay, so as you can see over here. So the enamel uh, is of normal hardness, but of variable thickness, okay? So there is pitting that you see, and you see grooving of the teeth, and sometimes, many times the teeth appear um, smaller in size with abnormal cuspid morphology. So this is a problem with the hypoplastic type. So between the, uh, the two types, the hypomaturation type is more common, okay? Uh, but the more more damaging or, uh, is the more common type and also the more damaging type. So hyperplastic type on the other hand, uh, smaller teeth size with uh, pitted enamel that can be seen. 
okay now this is the uh, clinical uh, presentation now the environmental type of enamel hyperplasia okay is associated with various causes so nutritional deficiencies vitamin d vitamin a vitamin c exanthematous diseases that means if uh, diseases that produce uh, skin eruptions and uh, present and uh, have uh, the children usually have fever can affect uh, the enamel maturation as well as enamel formation congenital syphilis hypocalcemia birth injury prematurity premature delivery uh, hereditary hemolytic disease local infection or trauma fluoride or idiopathic causes okay all of this categorize the environmental type of enamel hyperplasia this is uh, again an example of a patient with uh, hyperplastic enamel if you look at it this is the normal enamel this is the hyperplastic enamel that's why it's 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 uh, abraded and uh, eroded over here and that's why there is pigmentation that you are able to see of the the now this is uh, a clinical picture of dental fluorosis so again fluoride okay when when uh, a child is exposed to high content of fluoride in ground water that or the drinking water then fluoride affects the amelogenesis okay or the enamel formation and that actually affects the 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 appearance of enamel as well as the, the structure and form fluorosis is usually endemic okay they if there is a fluoride content of more than 0.9 to 1 part per million uh, in in the drinking water then it affects the then affects the enamel uh, formation of teeth and uh, basically what happens is the fluoride damages the ameloblast is affecting the enamel matrix formation and the calcification process okay which gives rise to white flecks spots spitting and brownish staining this is a picture uh, where there is mild fluorosis uh, that means very few this is a moderate fluorosis you are able to see pitting on so many uh... okay next is uh, this is a picture of a patient with congenital syphilis so congenital syphilis basically again this is a condition where uh, syphilis is transmitted from mother to child and the child as the child grows he will actually identify uh, effects on the enamel that's because the syphilis uh, affects the syphilis organism actually affects the the amyl, uh, process of amylogenesis and uh, here in this case we are able to identify uh, the presence of something called as uh, screwdriver shaped uh, incisors okay moving on to dentinogenesis imperfecta now dentinogenesis imperfecta as the term states is uh, uh, imperfect formation of dentin right and uh, this is an autosomal dominant condition affects both dentitions okay the protein that affects because of this uh, autosomal condition is the dentin clo phosphoprotein okay the tooth appear gray to yellowish brown broad crown with constriction of the cervical area okay enamel is easily broken the severe attrition that is seen and radiographically the teeth appear solid lacking pulp chambers and root canal so this is a clinical picture of a patient with uh, dentinogenesis imperfecta and as you can notice there is severe uh, attrition of uh, the entire uh, maxillary and mandibular teeth and uh, the deep yellow color of, of the tooth okay so basically the enamel is entirely lost and uh, the dentine is, is defective so the classification of uh, dentinogenesis imperfecta is according to is, is described under revised shields classification so we have dentinogenesis type uh, type 1 which is called dentinogenesis imperfecta uh, associated with osteogenesis imperfecta okay which is a, a, a defect in the collagen all right uh, which is a defect in the collagen uh, dentinogenesis imperfecta type 2 which is also called brandywine type or the shell teeth okay now type 1 dentinogenesis imperfecta type 1 the teeth are blue gray or amber brown the enamel splits readily from the dentine okay uh, because of the defective uh, dentine the enamel is not supported well and thus easily breaks down on x-ray bulbous crowns narrow roots uh, canals and pulp chambers 
uh, which are obliterated. The are, intelligence is imperfecta type 2, okay, is uh, found in brandy wine, which is, uh, uh, which is a tri-racial uh, isolate uh, is seen in southern Maryland. Okay, the crowns of both dentitions wear rapidly and multiple pulp exposures are seen. The x-ray of deciduous uh, teeth show large chambers and root canals in the early years. The x-ray of permanent teeth show normal or small pulp chambers or obliterated teeth. Okay. Now, shell teeth uh, is the term that is used to describe this because there is a thin dentine and a large pulp chamber thus giving rise to the, 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 uh, the reddish uh, hue uh, in, in the intelligences imperfecta type 2. Now, dentinogenesis imperfecta type 2 affects only the teeth, okay, and uh, various books actually give uh, a different classification for this, okay, so I'd just like to run you through. So, some book actually classify dentinogenesis imperfecta as type 1, type 2, and type 3, okay, but if you look at the revised Shields classification, type 2 and type 3 is clumped together to make it type 2. Now, the reason that is taking place is because earlier, uh, brandy wine type was considered to be a specific type of dentinogenesis imperfecta that occurs only in the group of people, tri-racial uh, group of people in Southern Maryland in America. But now uh, isolated cases have been found in other parts of the world as well. And that's why that's the reason uh, the, the appearance uh, of dentinogenesis imperfecta has been categorized broadly into two types. One is that affects along with osteogenesis imperfecta and the other that affects only the teeth, okay? So that's how it goes. This is the, the appearance of uh, dentinogenesis imperfecta type 2, again affecting all, all the teeth here, all right? So if you look at it, uh, the enamel is very thinned out, the, the dentine is exposed, uh, the dentine and is attrited and pulp is uh, very close to be exposed. Now this is the pedigree, this is an example of pedigree analysis basically just to show you how um, the, the autosomal dominant gene has over the years um, uh, affected all generations. All right, so this is the, the first generation, this is the second generation of, of, of uh, offsprings that have been affected. This is the third generation of offsprings that have been affected. And this is the first generation okay so the the phenotypic expression can vary from from person to person if you look at this a person the teeth look absolutely normal whereas if you look at 4 to uh, the fourth generation uh, the teeth are, are very severely affected so this is again depends on the penetrance of the gene okay so penetrance of the gene basically means uh, the level of expression uh, of the gene leading to the defect in the protein production and thus giving rise to the, the clinical appearance of, of a particular tissue. So here in this case, basically the dentinogenesis imperfecta gene, which gives rise to, uh, if it is severely affected, then uh, a large part of the dentin CLO protein is affected, production of the protein is affected, giving rise to uh, dentinogenesis imperfecta, right? The next is dentine dysplasia. Okay, now dentine dysplasia is rare. It is again hereditary and autosomal dominant. But the difference between dentine dysplasia and dentinogenesis imperfecta is the fact that in dentine dysplasia, enamel is normal. Okay, there is only atypical dentine and pulp morphology. Okay, uh, if you recall in the previous slides, uh, in dentinogenesis imperfecta, the enamel also is. Uh, uh, is thinned out and and uh, is lost rapidly okay whereas in dentine dysplasia that's not the case you have a normal enamel atypical dentine and pulp morphology so this is classified dentine dysplasia is classified as type 1 and type 2 based on whether it affects the apical part or the radicular dentine dysplasia or if it affects the coronal dentine dentine Type 1, both dentitions are affected, the teeth appear normal, there is normal eruption pattern, mobility and premature exfoliation is noted, uh, abnormal short blunt or conical roots are seen, pulp in deciduous is obliterated before eruption but permanent uh, teeth show crescent shaped remnants. Now a histological feature, basically if, you, if these teeth exfoliate and we do a ground section then we notice 
calcified uh, tubular dentine that obliterates the pulp but appears as lava flowing around. Okay. Uh, this is a case of uh, dentine dysplasia affecting the entire dentition. Okay. And this is how this is the normal uh, enamel that you notice over here whereas this is how the dentine appears. So this dentine appearance of dentine is described as lava flowing around uh, boulder. Type 2 dentine dysplasia. Type 2 dentine dysplasia on the other hand is uh, uh, again affects both dentitions okay but uh, varying varies in expression. The deciduous teeth appear similar to dentinogenesis imperfecta but permanent teeth are normal. Pulp chambers of deciduous teeth are obliterated but are not uh, pre-eruptive okay uh, that means they are not uh, obliterated uh, before eruption. Permanent teeth show large pulp chambers in the coronal portion which is described as a thistle tube shape. Pulp stones may be seen or pulp calcifications might be seen and amorphous and atubular dentine is seen in the radicular portion while the coronal part appears normal, right? So type 2 basically uh, is, is called as coronal dentinal dysplasia. That means the uh, radicular part is where there is amorphous and atubular dentine seen but the coronal part appears uh, to be. Right, so moving on to craniofacial anomalies. So uh, deformities of the cranium and facial bones together is categorized as craniofacial anomalies. Uh, there are multifactorial causes here. There are genetic causes, there are environmental causes and uh, uh, more specifically folic acid deficiency has been associated to be related to craniofacial anomalies. Now that is because uh, through research it's been identified that folic acid is uh, a very important uh, very important uh, vitamin that is required for neural crest cell migration which is an important uh, uh, component of in the development of craniofacial structures all right and that's the reason why uh, pregnant women are are pre prescribed folic acid uh, all through pregnancy So the first uh, and the most common craniofacial anomaly that you, I'm sure all of you must have seen is cleft lip. So this is a picture of a patient with uh, a child with cleft lip and uh, this occurs because of uh, again multifactorial causes and uh, uh, folic acid deficiency wherein the lip processes fail to fail to fuse during the during second is cleft lip, lip and palate where there's a lip and as well as a palatal uh, fusion deficiency okay that further I will explain clear cleft lip and palate further okay this is craniosynostosis whereas there is uh, early uh, closure of the uh, cranial sutures giving rise to the abnormal morphology of the this is uh, plagiocephaly again wherein there is a depression or an abnormal shape of the cranium uh, because of various causes and this is a patient with hemifacial microsomia. Now, microsomia, again, this is a rare congenital condition in which tissues on one side of the face are undeveloped. Okay, so if you look at this, this side of the entire face, all tissues basically are, are underdeveloped in this patient. Okay, so let's look at cleft lip and palate because I think this is something very uh, important to, to dental surgeons and you as undergraduate students uh, should, should know it well. Okay. Now, just to recall some of the embryological developmental process during the seventh week intrauterine, medial, lateral, and nasal, uh, medial and lateral nasal and frontonasal processes fuse to form the primary palate. I'm sure you, you remember that. Uh, during the eighth week, the palatal shells form, right? During the ninth to tenth week, the mandibular arches enlarge and the tongue drops down. And during the eleventh and twelfth week uh, of, of development of a child, the palatal fusion is complete anterior posteriorly okay so if uh, cleft lip and palate is to occur basically these are the various stages during which there is a problem that takes place and it leads to a cleft lip or a cleft lip and palate so this is just to recall this is the median nasal process right this is the lateral nasal process this is the maxillary process right? and uh, this is how the palatal shelves are present right and 11th and 12th a week when the tongue descends the palatal processes are able to fuse so when if the tongue fails to descend then it leads to uh, failure of fusion of the palatal shelves giving rise to cleft palate
Etiology again, as I mentioned, is hereditary. There are polygenic inheritance, stress, uh, physiological, emotional, and traumatic stress has been identified. Drugs such as corticosteroids, uh, maternal alcohol consumption, and cigarette smoking, mechanical disturbances, infections have been uh, have been identified as as various etiologies for cleft lip and palate. Okay, so there are syndromic clefts and there are non-syndromic clefts. So syndromic clefts are where uh, the presence of cleft lip and palate is associated with certain other uh, syndromes, okay, uh, whereas non-syndromic clefts are basically isolated cleft lip and palate, okay. So these are various uh, images of, of, of children affected with cleft lip, cleft lip and palate, unilateral cleft lip, uh, so, so on and so forth, various combinations of, of this, this enormous. So this is this is an infographic here. So this is a uh, normal uh, normally appearing uh, image, right? This is the normal palette, okay? With uh, uh, this is cleft palate alone, okay? So this is cleft lip, just cleft lip. How would it look uh, when it affects the, the nasal and uh, this? This is cleft lip with partial involvement of the palate, and this is bilateral cleft lip, bilateral cleft lip, and involvement of the palate. Okay, so this is the problem that uh, this is the problem how it appears clinically. Okay, there is something called as a views classification, which is the most accepted classification. So, which categorizes uh, cleft lips and palate into group one, group two, group three, or group four, A, B, C, and D, respectively. So, group A is where defects only affect the soft palate, B is where uh, defects affect the in hard palate and the soft palate. Uh, C is where their defect affect the soft palate uh, right until to the alveolus involving usually involving the lip and uh, group 4 is where there is complete bilateral cleft. So this is the the infographic to explain the same okay just the soft palate, soft palate, hard palate, soft palate, hard palate and the alveolus uh, and one unilateral lip and this is the bilateral. So the treatment for cleft lip and palate is a surgical and multidisciplinary approach. A rule that is usually followed by maxillofacial surgeons is the rule of 10, wherein uh, intervention is done only when the kid is is 10 pounds in weight, has a HP of 10, and is 10 weeks of age. Okay, so that's the the rule rule of thumb for the surgical intervention that is done for cleft lip and palate. Uh, lip closures are followed by multi step uh, multi stage palate closures. Okay. And uh, the there are various. Um, uh, it's a multidisciplinary approach. So a patient with cleft lip and palate is is usually a patient uh, who needs to be taken care by a, not just a dentist but a general dentist, an orthodontist, a maxillofacial surgeon, a speech pathologist, a pediatrician, uh, and a whole team. Okay, uh, and uh, working together as a team. Uh, actually ensures that the patient has good outcomes at the uh, end of the day okay so thank you very much and uh, i acknowledge the free source images from google images that i have used in this uh, lecture thank you